Okay. So hello everyone, my name is Katie Cantrell. I'm the founder and executive director of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. We're a local nonprofit based in Oakland dedicated to educating people about the impacts of our food choices. Hello. Thanks for coming. So today I'm going to give you our basic talk which discusses the intersection of a lot of different issues and how they're impacted by factory farming. So I'll start off just by giving the basics of factory farming, what it is, how it got started, then I'll go through quickly what it looks like for the different industries, I'll talk about the impacts on workers and the environment, and we'll conclude by talking about what we can do both as individuals and as activists. And there is some disturbing content, it's impossible to talk about factory farming without it being disturbing, but there aren't any gory slaughterhouse videos or anything like that. And there will be a little cuteness interludes at the end of each section to give you a chance to ask questions. So how many of you say old McDonald's when you were kids? Show of hands. <laughs> so most everyone, right? So when we walk into a supermarket, we look around at the pictures on products, it looks like this. It looks like old McDonald's farm. There's all those rolling green hillsides, all those happy cows. But as I'm here to talk to you about, this is not what farming is like anymore in the United States. So rather than old McDonald's, this is what we have today. Factory farms are technically known as concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. It's a practice of keeping thousands of animals confined into a single shed to produce the most product for the most profit. The basis for factory farming actually began in the 1920s with the invention of vitamin supplements. This allowed the animals to graze indoors with supplements, like vitamin D, rather than outside, as humans have always done. Since then, the invention of different types of machines and antibiotics has allowed for the growth of factory farming. So light and air filtration machines ensure that the animals never need to see the light of day or breathe fresh air. They spend their entire lives indoors. And antibiotics ensure that no matter how unsanitary the conditions, the animals will not die off the margin. Family farmers have mostly become a thing of the past, thanks to factory farms. In each of these industries, just four companies control a majority of production. As a result, more than half a million hog farmers have gone into business in the past 25 years. So as we can see, this entire segment of our food system is really controlled by just a handful of corporations. So you might wonder, well, why factory farming? Why has this taken off? And the simple answer is cheap food. So, if you talk to someone who works for an agribusiness corporation, they'll tell you that they're helping the world by producing this cheap food. And it's true that as Americans, we currently pay less for our food than we ever have in our nation's history. But as we'll see, this supposedly cheap food actually comes at a very steep price. So before we get any further, I suspect there's some of you in the room who already know the answer to this question. For those of you who don't already know, does anyone want to guess how many animals are bred and killed for food every year in the United States? Millions. Millions? All right. 300 million? 300 million? No, more. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So we have millions, 300 million? Yeah. Nine billion animals are raised every single year just in the United States alone. And this is just land mammals in the United States every single year. So worldwide, this number is about 70 billion animals. So of those 9 billion animals, does anyone want to guess what percentage of them are raised on factory farms? Yes. <laughs> 99%. So virtually all meat in the United States now comes from factory farms. So with that in mind, I'm going to move on and talk about what life is like for these 9 billion animals raised in the U.S. Sure. And I'm going to start off by my chicken, I was reading it. specifically layer hens. So this is Lucy. She is a real-life layer hen. And layer hens are the chickens raised to produce eggs. And they've been bred to produce three times more eggs on factory farms than they usually would in nature. So I'm going to tell you what Lucy's life was like when she lived on a factory farm. Shortly after she was born, she had her beak cut off without anesthetic. This is an extremely painful process called deep beating. Now, in natural con conditions, chickens develop a hierarchy, so you've probably heard of a pecking order, right? But in confinement, there's not enough space for the chickens to maintain their usual social relationships, so they get really stressed out and they start to attack each other. So in order to keep them from killing each other, the workers preemptively sear off their beaks. <coughs> now, this procedure is extremely painful for them. Their beaks are full of nerve endings, and many of the chicks actually die after this process is done because it's simply too painful for them to eat. Um, so I usually have a video, I don't think it's going to load today, that shows this industrial machine where the chicks come down from there about the load, they're stuck head first into the spinning mechanism, and there's a laser in the middle now that sears off the ends of their beaks, and they're just dumped down a chute. And it's, it's such a far cry from what most of us imagine when we think about where our food is coming from. So after Lucy was deep beaked, she was then put into what we see here, which is called a battery cage. 
So she lived in this cage with seven other chickens. And you can see the space is so small that she couldn't even move. She couldn't turn around. She's crammed right up against the other chickens, right up against the bars of that cage. And she was standing on top of wire mesh for one entire year. She never left that cage. And she was living in a barn with tens of thousands of other chickens, all crammed into those cages, just stacked row upon row on top of each other. So usually what happens is the chickens are kept like this for about a year, at which point their bodies give out from these stressful and unnatural conditions. And then at that point, usually they're sent off to slaughter to become chicken nuggets, dog food, all of those liver chicken products. But as I mentioned, Lucy was a special case. So she came from a factory farm um, near Modesto where the owner went bankrupt. And so he abandoned 30,000 chickens to die. And about 17,000 of them did die before Animal Place, which is a farm animal sanctuary, came in. And they were able to rescue some of those hens. So Lucy was one of the very lucky few that was rescued. So she's now living out the rest of her life in the conditions that we imagine chickens should be living in. You know, she's pecking and dirty grass. She's lying in the sunlight. But the reality is that 80% of chickens today spend their entire lives confined in those spider cages. So you might wonder, well, what about Lucy's brothers? What about the male chicks? They obviously don't lay eggs. And because layer hens have been bred to produce a lot of eggs and not to get big enough to be valuable for meat, they're not really very valuable for anything. So they're literally discarded, which is what we see here. They're thrown alive into a dumpster where they're just left to suffocate or die of starvation. Alternatively, sometimes they're thrown into a wood chipper and fed back to the chickens as feed. So this is one byproduct of the egg industry that not very many people are aware of. So if you're first cuteness into the room, uh, I know this is a lot of heavy and disturbing information, so I want to give you a minute to kind of take a breath and process and also to ask any questions if you have them. No questions so far? Okay. So I'm going to move on then and talk about broiler chickens. So broiler chickens are the chickens that have been bred to produce meat. And this is Gryffindor, another animal that was rescued by Animal Place. Our chicken has been bred to grow bigger than ever before, more quickly than ever before. Since 1935, the average daily growth rate of broiler chickens has increased over 400%. So here we can see this is a fully grown chicken at 68 days old in 1950, and this is a fully grown chicken at just 47 days old in 2008. So it's almost unrecognizable as the same species from just a few decades before. Because they grow so quickly, they are now fully grown and ready to be slaughtered when they're just six weeks old. So to give you a comparison, this is like if we bred humans to weigh 600 pounds by the time they were 12 years old. As you might imagine, this unnaturally fast growth places a lot of stress on the chickens' bodies. They didn't evolve to grow that big, let alone that quickly. As a result, 90% of the chickens can't even walk normally because their legs simply can't support all of that unnatural weight. So once the chickens are fully grown and ready to be sent to slaughter, in the case of broiler chickens that are just six weeks old for lay hens when they're about a year old, they're first loaded onto crates on trucks, as we see here. According to the expected rates, a single worker should create 30 birds per minute. So in order to work that quickly, the birds have to be handled roughly. They can just grab a bunch of them by their legs and throw them onto these crates like we see here. As a result, there's about a 30% chance that these birds will have freshly broken bones by the time they're out of the slaughterhouse from the stress of this transport process. So in the United States, there's basically only one federal protection for farm animals, and that's the Humane Method of Slaughter Act. This states that animals must be unconscious prior to slaughter in order to ensure a quick and relatively painless death. But chickens and turkeys, which make up the vast majority of all animal slaughter in the United States, are actually exempt from this law. So they don't have any federal protections as to how they're slaughtered. Why were they accepted? Pretty much anything you see is because it's expensive for them, because it's their property. powerful lobby, so um, a lot of people in the regulatory agencies actually work for those corporations, so basically if something is too expensive and difficult to implement, they'll, they'll get an exemption for themselves. Another example of something like this, for instance, rabbits are classified as poultry under slaughtering acts. So there are a lot of things like that that don't make up a lot of sense, but industry is lobby for it. It sounds like the Supreme Court classified them. So once the chickens arrive at the slaughterhouse, they're hung up by their legs into shackles on a moving conveyor belt system like we see here. And remember, their legs are often broken at this point. So they move down the conveyor belt, and then either a worker or a machine slits their throat, and they continue to move down the line as they die of blood loss. Now this is what happens if the process is done correctly. 
But according to government estimates, about 4 million birds are alive and fully conscious when they go into the scalding tank, that's what we see here, where they're then literally boiled alive. So anytime that we eat chicken or products made with eggs, we have no way of knowing whether that bird was one of the millions that is literally boiled alive every year. So when we give these presentations, we get a lot of questions about what about pH-free, humane, all of those labels. So I'm going to walk you through what each of those labels really means. And we'll start with cage-free. So this is a cage-free egg farm. And it's true that these hens aren't in cages, but this really isn't what most people imagine when they see the term humane, cage-free, they see those idyllic looking labels. It's still a factory farm, and there's still tens of thousands of hens confined in this very small space for their entire lives. And as you can imagine, this is extremely stressful for them, so they still have to be de beaked and that's perfectly allowable under cage-free labeling. So what about free range? According to the USDA standards, free-range chickens must have access to the outdoors with no actual space specifications. So a shed with 30,000 chickens in it and a tiny door on one end that opens onto a little dirt patch counts as free-range even if not a single chicken ever actually steps foot outside because they have access to the outdoors. So here on the left we see a picture of the wording on the packaging for Judy's eggs. And it says, these hens are raised in wide open spaces in Sonoma Valley, where they're free to roam, scratch, and play. Well, here on the right, you can see a picture of what Judy's egg farm actually looks like. And I don't see any chickens outside. These are industrial sheds. This is a factory farm. And this is a manure pit. That's where all the chickens' manure goes. We'll talk about that later. So they actually settled a lawsuit for misleading consumers with the claims on their packaging. But they're still labeled as free range. And actually, Judy's Family Farm also relabels their own eggs, so they're also marketed as Uncle Eddie's, Rock Island, Full Circle, and they supply Whole Foods 365 brand and Orga Organic Valley, which for people who you know, don't know better are some of the more respected free-range cage-free labels, but we can see what this actually looks like. So what about organic? Organic has the same standards, so they, they can't, um, organic eggs can't from, come from hens that are cut in battery cages. And again, they have to have that outdoor access, which is pretty much meaningless. Other than that, it mostly has to do with the input, so it's more about consumer health than animal welfare. So the animals aren't allowed to be given hormones, antibiotics, or genetically modified feed that's been treated with pesticides. So the eggs have fewer toxic um, inputs, but it still doesn't say much about the animal welfare. The hens are still debeaked, and they're still kept by the tens of thousands in those sheds. Is it still in the meat when you eat it? Um, it depends on... It depends on the hormone and antibiotic, but I mean, generally, organic is safer. Um, but okay, so what about humane? Humane has no legal meaning whatsoever. Any company can slap this on their label if they feel like it. So this is a picture of Kroger's. Also, natural is the same way. Natural chicken breast cutlets. These came from a Tyson factory farm using all of the standard factory farming practices. So natural and humane mean absolutely nothing. And it's really sad because, I mean, consumers are looking for these labels because they care about animal welfare. They want to make sure that the animals are treated properly. But companies, rather than responding to that desire by improving conditions, are responding with this false labeling. And often they mark up the price a few dollars too. You know, they're charging consumers more for the same product. So, another cute misinformation. <laughs> other questions? Okay, so moving on. Now I'm going to talk about cows. So this is Sadie the dairy cow. She's another animal place animal. And just some background for you. Cows, like all mammals, only produce milk when they're pregnant or nursing in order to feed their offspring. They're not magical milk machines that just produce milk all the time. Humans are the only species that consume milk after we're no longer babies. And we are definitely the only species that regularly drinks a different species milk. It's a little bit strange when we stop and think about it. We don't see dogs drinking cat milk or anything like that. And actually, that's all thanks to a European genetic mutation. So about 75% of adults in the world are to some extent lactose intolerant. So it's not inherently natural for humans to drink milk from cows. So in order to get large quantities of milk from the cows, the cows must first be impregnated. This is done via forcible artificial insemination using a device that the industry itself calls the reef rack. So there's a real feminist concern about exploiting these female animals solely for their reproductive system. And if this is something that you're interested in, there's a really fantastic book called The Sexual Politics of Meat by Carol J. Adams, which delves more into these issues. So once a cow has been impregnated, she carries her calf for nine months. They have the same gestation period as humans do. And then shortly after giving birth, her calf is then forcibly removed from her. 
Um, I usually show a video, it's not going to load. Um, there's an undercover investigation of it at a dairy farm in New York where you can see the workers literally ripping the calves from their mother's sides. And the reason this is done is that if we allow the calves to drink their mother's milk, there wouldn't be as much milk for us to take to sell to humans for profit. And this process, as you can imagine, is extremely traumatic for the both the mother cows and for their calves. There's nothing that they want more than to be together. So after the calves have been taken from their mothers, the female calves are raised on the farm to be dairy calves to take their mother's places. And for the first few months of their life, they're kept in these hutches that we see here. And you can see this yourself driving through Petaluma. That's how I first learned about this. Um, I was driving through this, down in front of this field that supplied clover, and I saw row upon row these little white crates, and I thought, that's kind of strange, I wonder what that is. So I looked it up online, and I found out that each of those crates has a little baby calf in it. So you can see one of them in the foreground there. And so she'll never see her mother again, she never gets to play with other calves, she can barely take um, just a few steps. And she will live in a confinement like this until she is old enough to be impregnated and start giving milk. The male calves are either auctioned off for meat or they're sold to veal farms, where they're kept completely immobilized until they're about 20 weeks old and then they're sent to slaughter. So a lot of people don't eat veal because it's regarded as one of the cooler animal products, but often people don't realize that the veal industry is actually a byproduct of the dairy industry. So it's all of those unwanted male dairy calves. So once their babies have been taken away from them, the mothers are hooked up to machines three times a day that take the milk intended for their calves. They're milked like this for about 10 to 12 months, at which point they're again artificially inseminated. The calves are again taken away from them, and they're again milked three times a day. And this happens to them year after year, until either they can no longer produce enough milk, or they can no longer be impregnated. Then at that point, they're sent off to slaughter, most likely to become hamburger meat, or dog food, or these little baby products. Because of the unnaturally large amount of milk that cows are forced to produce, they frequently develop mastitis, which is a painful udder infection. According to the industry's own estimates, 30 to 50 percent of cows develop mastitis at some point in their lives. Part of the reason that they are producing so much milk is due to the use of recombinant bovine growth hormone, RBGH or RDST. This was created by Monsanto, and it increases milk production by 15 percent. It also increases mastitis by 25 percent and lameness, which is foot or leg problems, by 55%. So it's actually illegal in all of the European Union just because of animal welfare reasons. But that's definitely not the only problem with bovine growth hormone. So milk from cows given both bovine growth hormone contains higher levels of tufts, antibiotics, and the hormone insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1. Milk from cows given bovine growth hormone have uh, IGF-1 levels 10 times higher than non milk. And this is a problem because several lesson studies have shown a connection between high circulating IGF-1 levels and cancer risk. So one study found that women with high IGF-1 levels are seven times as likely to develop breast cancer. And it's been linked to colon, prostate, and lung cancer as well. So because of this, it's currently illegal in almost every other industrialized country. And both the American Public Health Association and the American Nurses Association have urged for the elimination of bovine growth hormone in our food because it poses such a public health risk but still no action has been taken. Okay, so what about local? This is another question we get. Here in the Bay Area, we have Berkeley Farms, which a lot of people assume is some nice little local farm. It turns out Berkeley Farms is owned by Dean Foods, which is the, the country's largest dairy manufacturer. So just like with Judy's Eggs, we see that these big corporations rebrand their products to look like nice little local farms. But Berkeley Farms is a factory farm through and through. They don't even have their own farm. They source from suppliers around California who use factory farming practices. So what about organic? Once again, organic is more about inputs and consumer health than about the treatment of the animals. So um, organic cows are not allowed to be given bovine growth hormone or other antibiotics or pesticides, so it is slightly better because of that, both for the cows and for consumers, but it again doesn't say much about animal welfare. So I actually had the chance to speak face to face with this grass representative and I asked her two questions. I asked at what age do they separate the calves from the mothers and she said when they're just a few days old. And I asked what they do with the male calves and with the spent calves and she said that they auction them off. So even Strauss, which is generally regarded as like the best of the best, still separates the calves from the mothers and takes no responsibility for whether or not their calves become veal. So these processes are extremely traumatic both for the mothers and for the babies, and they're really endemic to the dairy industry. So, is that a cutest interlude? Um, and a blouse. So many places. Yeah. Anyway.
Any questions about the jury industry? Is he wearing a harness? I think he's wearing like a little jacket. It was cold outside that day, I guess. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to move on now and talk about pigs. So this is Ruby, another animal place animal. And just some background for you. Pigs are extremely intelligent animals. They're actually much smarter than dogs and cats. They're one of the smartest animals on the planet. They're also very friendly, very social creatures. How many of you have seen Esther the pig on Facebook? Yeah, I highly recommend you check it out. She's a, um, they bought her thinking she was like a little teacup pig, one of the ones that's meant to be a pet, but she grew into a full-size like pig that they raise on factory farms. But they kept her anyway, so now she's a member of the family and runs around and plays with the dogs and takes baths, and it's super cute. So you can see just how friendly and personal pigs are. But on factory farms, pigs begin with a pregnant sow. It's a pregnant mother pig. She spends the 16 weeks of her pregnancy confined in a gestation crate, which is what you see there on the left. And this is so small that she cannot even turn around. These things literally go insane from boredom, from isolation, from depression, from frustration at just not being able to escape from this cage. They'll compulsively bite the bars of the cage or just bang their heads against the sides of the crate because they want so desperately to escape. And on top of being extremely bad for animal welfare, this is also extremely unsanitary. As you can imagine, if she can't move from that spot for 16 weeks, she can't go someplace else to go to the bathroom. So she's standing on top of a slatted floor, so all of her urine and feces just goes directly beneath her into giant pits. And you can see some of the filth leaking out onto that walkway. This causes a really painful buildup of ammonia and a horrible stench. Pigs actually have more sensitive noses than people do. And it's also really dangerous for the workers on factory farms. So over 50% of workers on pig factory farms experience chronic bronchitis from breathing in all of that fecal matter. So after she's given birth, she's then put into a fair room crate, which is what we see here on the right. Now here she's forced to continuously nurse her piglets without being allowed any other form of contact with them. And sometimes she's even kept strapped to the floor while she's in this fair room crate, so she can't move whatsoever. And then on the left, we see a natural pig's nest. So she's gathered up broken straw to nurse her baby. She's kind of nuzzling them. And here we see one of these sparing crates. And if you talk to someone who works for an agribusiness corporation, they'll tell you that these sparing crates are necessary to keep the piglets from, keep the mother pigs from crushing their piglets. And it's true, I mean, if all you did was remove those metal bars, she probably would crush her piglets. But it's not a really good evolutionary strategy to crush all of your offspring. Mm -hmm. If she's given any sort of space to walk around, stretch her legs, if she has some bedding, and if she can actually smell her piglets rather than just smelling that ammonia stench, she definitely won't crush them. And this is one theme that we see again and again, that these unnatural conditions on factory farms lead to problems that necessitate even more unnatural solutions, like cutting off chickens' beaks or keeping these mother pigs in barren birds. So after the piglets are born, they have their tails, teeth, and testicles removed without any sort of pain relief. This is just like with chicken bee beaking. When the pigs are kept in confinement, they get really stressed out, and pigs show aggression by biting each other's tails. So they'll bite off the tails that can get infected and animals can die. So they preemptively cut off and cauterize their tails. So one question that we get a lot is, how can this possibly be legal? Why isn't the government doing something? Now, animal cruelty laws aren't done at the federal level. They're done at the state level. And every state now has a law against animal cruelty. But almost every state also has what's called a common farming, farming practice exemption. Now this states that if a practice is commonly done on a factory farm, it is automatically legal. So the government lets these corporations define for themselves whether or not something counts as cruelty. So cutting up a puppy's tail without anesthetic or keeping a pregnant dog locked in a closet for 16 weeks would be felony animal cruelty. But when done to animals that are actually even smarter than dogs, it's perfectly legal because it's common practice on factory farms.
So as a result, in the Atlantic, wild fish populations have decreased by 95% in the last decade. And by some estimates, if we keep this up, by 2050, there aren't going to be enough fish in the oceans left anymore for, for people to fish. And another problem with this type of fishing, in addition to being extremely um, not sustainable, is that, as you can imagine, if you're just sweeping up everything in your path, you're getting a lot more besides the tuna or salmon or whatever kind of fish you're trying to catch. And that problem is called bycatch. So these are the other sea creatures that are swept up in those nets. And they're caught, sometimes they die in the nets, sometimes they die on board the ship, and then they're just tossed back dead into the water. This includes sea turtles, sharks, dolphins, whales, any creature that you would find in the ocean. This problem is particularly bad for shrimp. So for every one pound of shrimp that they catch, there are 26 pounds of other sea creatures that are caught and killed. So because we're so quickly depleting the ocean's fisheries, we're increasingly turning to what's called aquaculture, which is fish farming. And this is just like a mammal factory farm. So those little circles that you see there are these netted tents that they keep in open rivers or ocean. And it's just like with the mammal factory farm, they just cram as many fish in those pens as they can. So they're swimming on top of each other. They don't have any sort of space. And you have all the same problems that you do with mammal factory farming. So anytime that you keep that many animals crammed together, you're going to have tremendous amounts of waste. And that's why they keep these pens in open rivers or oceans, is they don't have to deal with that waste. It just washes off into the river or into the ocean and into those local ecosystems, which creates these dead zones where no other animals can live. And you get to drink it. <laughs> well, it's a funny animal. But, and also, when anytime you have that many animals cramped together, it's really easy for bacteria to spread. So they're not getting fish antibiotics in their feed, which again are washing out into local ecosystems. So when I first heard about fish farming, I thought, well, I guess at least you don't have the issue of bycatch. At least they're only raising the kind of fish they want to sell to the market. But it turns out that fish on fish farms are fed wild-caught fish. So it's really the worst of both worlds. And it's also extremely inefficient. So it takes 10 pounds of wild-caught feeder fish to make one pound of farm salmon. Is that cute? Is that Any questions about fish? I don't understand what the blue is. Uh, he was rescued, so it's like a little flotation device, I think, to help him learn how to swim. So I'm going to move on and talk about the impacts on workers. So I'm going to start by describing the life story of an average slaughterhouse worker. So Luis was a corn farmer in Mexico. When the United States flooded Mexico with cheap corn, thanks to free trade agreements like NAFTA, Luis couldn't earn a living from farming anymore. He couldn't support his family just by being a farmer. So one day, he heard an ad on the radio promising him a better life in the United States, good wages, housing, a chance for the American dream. So he boards a free bus that ties in his charter to drive him from Mexico to Nebraska to work at a slaughterhouse. Once Luis reaches the United States, however, he realizes that he's been cruelly misled. He faces one of the most dangerous jobs in the country. So slaughterhouse work is highly specialized. These workers are just doing the same one motion thousands and thousands of times every single day, which results in really high rates of cumulative trauma injuries or repetitive stress injuries. And these injuries are often debilitating for the rest of these workers' lives. So sometimes they're permanently debilitated after working at slaughterhouses for less than a year. On top of how extremely dangerous this job is, the workers don't have any sort of health insurance. And that's why these companies are purposely recruiting undocumented workers, as they know that they won't be able to speak out against these conditions. They can't turn unionized, go to the government or newspapers, because they'll simply be deported. And on top of that, these workers face a deeply disturbing job. So I don't think any of us would want to work slaughtering animals for a living. And, you know, if they don't have any sort of health care, they obviously don't have access to mental health care. So a lot of them turn to alcohol or to drugs in order to try to numb that pain. Actually, many of them develop post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, that's what soldiers coming back from war have, as a result of seeing so much suffering and death on a daily basis. So I think it's important for us to consider, if we aren't able to slaughter an animal ourselves, why force someone else to do the dirty work for us? And there's another job that even fewer people think about, and that's the job of a late night cleaning crew. So these people arrive at midnight, and by sunrise, they have to clean the remains of the three to 4,000 cattle that were slaughtered at the plant that day. Again, the vast majority of these workers are undocumented. They actually make even less money than regular slaughterhouse workers do, and they're cons um, they don't even keep track of their injury or death rates because they're not considered a single profession. But just to give you a single example of how dangerous this job is, 
At a national beef plant in Kansas, a man climbed into a blood collection tank 30 feet high to clean it, but he was overcome by the fumes and actually fell into the tank. Another man climbed into the tank to try to rescue him, but both were then drowned. Eight years earlier, another man had died in that very same tank, and two other men had died trying to save him. So for this, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the government agency that's supposed to protect workers on the job, they fined National Beef for their negligence. But the fine was $480 for each man's death, if not even a slap on the wrist. So clearly, even the government regards these workers as completely expendable. And I also want to mention, too, that legally, anyone who's selling animal products for human consumption has to sell them to USDA-approved industrial slaughterhouses. So even those local sustainable places are still shipping their animals to the Central Valley to be slaughtered in plants that are using these working conditions. Okay. Do you want to give us Any questions about the working conditions? Yes. A it is a rabbit. 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 So once again, remember that there are 9 billion animals raised in the United States every year. So this is 9 billion living, breathing, eating, pooping animals. And those 9 billion animals are eating genetically modified corn and soy. So animals on factory farms are the largest consumers of corn and soy in the US and the largest consumers of genetically modified crops. Now this is problematic for several reasons. First of all, growing all of these crops requires tremendous amounts of land. So animals are a very inefficient source of food because you have to grow all those crops to raise those animals and then you finally get the meat versus just growing those plants for humans to eat directly. So this infographic shows the land that it takes to produce one kilogram of protein. So here we can see Beyond Meat is a plant-based protein, so it's um, soy and whole grains. And you can see that uses just a tiny fraction of the land that it takes to produce animal-based proteins. And because animal products are so land-intensive, Animal agriculture is the leading cause of deforestation worldwide. About 80% of Amazon rainforest deforestation is to raise uh, cattle for the beef industry. This is also a leading cause of animals becoming endangered or extinct because we're destroying their habitats in order to make um, grazing land or land to grow corn and soy to feed to these animals. Another problem with all this corn and soy is that it's extremely water intensive. So this shows the gallons of water that it takes to produce a single pound of food that we buy at the supermarket. So I think most of us know by now beef is not great for the environment. It doesn't come as a huge surprise that it's the most water intensive product. It takes almost 2,500 gallons of water to produce a single pound of beef. What does surprise a lot of people is it takes over 2,000 gallons of water to produce a pound of butter. We can see that all of the most water intensive products are those animal products. In comparison, it takes just 54 gallons of water to produce a pound of broccoli, just 21 gallons of water to produce a pound of cabbage. So this is becoming an increasingly serious problem with climate change, and here in California, we're facing a really serious drought. And government agencies are urging us to take shorter showers or turn off the towel on and brush our teeth, which, I mean, you know, sure, you might as well do it, but the impact of that is minuscule to the impact that we can have by changing our diets. So my organization won advertisements on BART, on the transit system, and um, we're running this in the BART stations right now. Shows that you can save the same amount of water by skipping one gallon of milk or 27 showers. That's the same for a hamburger too. Skipping a hamburger is like um, saving a month's worth of showers. So again, the most efficient, effective change that we can make is to eat fewer animal products and more plant-based products. Great ad. Thank you. Thank you. And the final problem with all this GMO corn and soy is that it's been genetically modified to withstand Monsanto's Roundup pesticide. So most of the pesticide use in the US is being applied to crops, which are then fed to animals on factory farms. And those pesticide-laden crops, once they're processed, then have antibiotics added to them, partly to make the animals grow faster and partly to keep them from dying off, despite those extremely unsanitary conditions. So actually, 80% of all antibiotics in the United States are actually given to animals on factory farms. And according to the Centers for Disease Control, we may be faced with epidemics that do not respond to antibiotics if we continue these current factory farming practices. We're breeding antibiotic-resistant bacteria by giving these animals antibiotics. 
So all of that genetically modified corn and soy with all those pesticides and antibiotics is fed to these 9 billion animals and then goes through their systems and comes out as poop. So farm animals in the U.S. produce 130 times as much waste as the entire U.S. human population. So why do every man, woman, and child just pee and poop in the giant pits all year round? And that's what you have on factory farms. <laughs> So each of those little white rectangles that you see there is a pig factory farm with almost 9,000 animals in it, in each of those farms. So all of the poop from all of those pigs is pumped right here to this 20 million gallon manure lagoon. And if you look on the background, you can see three or four more of those manure lagoons. And you can see it just kept right there in the open air. So what happens, they dry it out a little bit, and then they have sprinkler systems that actually suck it in and shoot it 20 feet into the air to disperse it onto the surrounding lands. Yeah, it's unbelievable, but this is actually their, their method. And um, there's a really great documentary, Species is on the movie, for hosting a, screen, a screening in Oakland in October, if, anyone, if you haven't seen it. But um, yeah, he actually sneaks onto a pig factory farm, sees the sprinkler system, and he interviews people who live near these factory farms. There are communities often less than a mile away. So if the wind is blowing the wrong direction that day, they walk outside of their houses and they're splattered in pig poop. Yeah. And often they'll faint too from asphyxiation because of all the toxic gases and all this waste. So they spray onto the land where it either seeps into the local water table or runs off into local rivers. And sometimes they'll actually just dump it directly into the rivers because it's cheaper for them to pay the fine for polluting than to actually pay to have this waste treated properly. As a result, runoff from factory farms is a leading cause of water pollution in the United States. It's put over 35,000 miles of river in 22 states. And all this pollution also kills off all the fish. So factory farm runoff killed over 13 million fish in just three years. Another problem with all of this poop is climate change. So according to a report from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, animal agriculture accounts for more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector combined. That's more than all the planes, trains, and automobiles all added up together. So a big part of the reason for this is that animals directly emit greenhouse gases, especially cows. So cows burp methane, and their poop releases nitrous oxide. And methane is 20 times worse than carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide is up to 300 times worse than carbon dioxide. So what's coming out of cows is up to 300 times worse than what's coming out of our cars. And we can see this here in this chart, which shows the carbon footprint for a kilogram of protein. And again, that we can. See, the plant-based protein, the tofu, is, has a much lower carbon footprint than any of those animal-based products. So a lot of people say that chicken is the more sustainable meat, but we can see that carbon footprint for chicken is still three times that of this plant-based protein. Another problem with animal agriculture is that it requires a lot of transportation because the, the industry is highly centralized. So on average, meat travels about 1,500 miles from front to plate. So, for instance, there's a slaughterhouse in Southern California that kills pigs that have been shipped all the way over from Nebraska. Mm. When you take all this into account, a study by the University of Chicago found that consuming no animal products is 50% more effective at fighting global warming than switching from a standard car to a hybrid. So theoretically, anyway, a vegan driving a Hummer is doing more to stop climate change than an omnivore driving a Prius. Another study found that not eating meat just one day a week saves more greenhouse gas emissions than buying local food 100% of the time. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't buy local. There's a lot of great reasons to do that. But again, it's just like the saving water, where the things that we're told to do to decrease our carbon footprint, again, have, are tiny compared to the impact that we can have by changing our diets. And the final issue with all of this food is environmental racism. So factory farms are almost always located near low-income communities of color. And so these people disproportionately have to bear the brunt of our food choices. They can't open their windows because of the stench. There's clouds of flies. There's all that manure runoff. And they and their families suffer from migraines, nosebleeds, heart palpitations, asthma, a host of health problems breathing in all of those toxic fumes and all of that fecal matter. And the people who have to face these conditions are usually the people who can afford it the least. They're usually making below minimum wage, and they don't have any sort of health insurance. Final thing to say to you. Okay. So the bottom line of this presentation is that every purchase in a supermarket and every order from a menu are inevitably and powerfully linked with agricultural policy. So every time that we make a decision about food, we are farming by proxy. And there's some good news here, and that is that we have a choice. 
So if you think about it, we buy foods three to, or we eat food three times a day. There is no other industry that we participate in on such a regular basis. And so that means that our food choices are extremely powerful. If we continue to, you know, just do business as usual, buy all these factory farm products, factory farms will continue to thrive and pollute and exploit workers and animals because we are literally paying them to when we give them our money. But the flip side of that is that we can take action by not buying these products. And if you're concerned about the environment, the three worst products are beef, cheese, and lamb. Those have the highest carbon footprints. Um, if you're concerned about animal treatment, I mean, they're all bad, but arguably the three worst for animals are eggs, milk, and chicken. So I mention this because people often get hung up on labels. Sometimes people are intimidated by like, going 100% vegan overnight. But you know, it's not about slapping a label on yourself or being perfectly this way or that. It's really about looking at what goes into these products and whether we really want to be supporting that. And that's in line with our morals. And the other good news is that it's never been easier or tastier to buy products that don't support factory farming. So I highly recommend the website chooseveg.com. We've got a lot of great resources, a monthly meal plan, um, how to talk to your friends, how to eat if you're on a road trip. And you can see here just a sampling of some of the amazing products that are available nowadays. So you can still enjoy smoked apple sage sausages, chocolate walnut brownie ice cream, yogurt, milk, any of these things. Um, but they don't support factory farming. They're cruelty free, they're plant based, so they're healthier for us, they're better for the environment, better for animals. It's really a win win. And there's been a lot of interest in these foods nowadays because global leaders are realizing this is the way we've got to go. There just aren't enough resources to keep making these animal products in the quantities that people are demanding. So people like Bill Gates and Lee Ka Shing, who's the richest man in Asia, have been investing in those finds in the upper left there, Beyond Meat and Just Mayo. Um, Just Mayo, made by Hamden Creek Foods, is now available in Dollar Tree and Walmart and Target. So these products, they taste the same. They've done wine taste tests with chefs. They can't tell the difference. They're price competitive, they're accessible, and again, they're healthier and better for everyone. So even, you know, taking small steps, just trying out some of these products, substituting them into your diet, and really finding out what works best for you, I think is the best way to get started. And the other good news is that this works. A lot of people ask, you know, but I'm just one person, this is a systemic global problem, what difference do my food choices really make? And they make a huge difference. So we can see in the last five years, meat consumption has been steadily declining for the first time in over 50 years. And this difference that we see here, that decrease, that represents a billion animals. So there are a billion fewer animals slaughtered now than there were back in 2007. So if I were speaking to you then, I would have said there are 10 billion animals slaughtered, but now we're down to nine. And this decrease is a result of people like you and me deciding to eat fewer animal products. So our choices really do add up. And I just want to leave you with a final quote from Jonathan Sackler's Flowers Eating Animals. Just how destructive does a culinary preference have to be before we decide to eat something else? If contributing to the suffering of billions of animals that live miserable lives and find up and die in horrific ways isn't motivating, what would be? If being the number one contributor to the most serious threat faced by the planet, climate change, isn't enough, what is? And if you're tempted to put off these questions of conscience, to say not now, then when? So remember that every time you decide not to eat an animal product, you are taking action against one of the most destructive industries on the planet. Great. Thank you so much. Um, before we get into Q&A, I want to pass around the sign-up sheet. Um, so we are a local organization, as I mentioned, we're based in Oakland, and this is the bulk of what we do. So we are really just trying to get the truth out there to people about where our food is really coming from. So we give talks to schools, community groups, businesses, churches, nonprofits. And we have different versions of the presentation that are tailored to different audiences. So we're really trying to build bridges. We have environmental presentations, social justice, health, nutrition. We're just trying to get this, the word out there to new audiences. So if you know of any groups that might be interested in posting our presentation, please let us know um, on this form. This is for our monthly email list. And then you can check off a box if you want to volunteer. Um, you can check off if you want to schedule a presentation, if you know of any groups that might host it. You can just write that down there. And we also offer professional speaker trainings for people who are interested in learning to give this presentation themselves. So if you're interested in that, there's a little checkbox for it. And also, if you're not already um, veg, if you want to take a little pledge here, you can check that off, and um, we'll sign you up for weekly recipes and support. So I'll pass that down. Actually, maybe I'll Will the elementary schools let you go there, or do they? 
we, um, we don't, we're working on a version for elementary schools, but we don't currently have it available yet. Um, right now we have high schools and colleges. High school? Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Don't buy Monsanto products. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been harassed by any of these big companies, like trying to sue you or shut you up? Or? No, I mean, I think we're a little bit too small. They're mostly focused on human society, you know, the multi-million dollar organizations. But we do get some trolls sometimes on our Facebook. At one point, we had a bunch of people. And I clicked on their profiles, and they like didn't have any friends. So it was like shadow profiles. <laughs> <by> <laughs> <and> <laughs> So we get a little bit, but nothing too bad so far. How big is your organization? Um, we have, uh, I'm currently the only paid staff member, so we're, we're pretty small, but we've got a really good team of volunteers. We've trained over 60 presenters. We have about um, 15 active presenters in the Bay Area right now. And we actually just launched chapters in Portland and Toronto as well. We're really trying to spread this model of education across the country. Yeah. How about Mexico? I did a tour in Mexico um, year before last. There was a group called Justice Without Boundaries group of activists and chefs who went around, um, had a presentation translated into Spanish with information about Smithfield expanding to Mexico. Um, I spoke to some universities down there. And, yeah, so we, we have done some outreach in Mexico. Yeah. Do you also do meatless Mondays in school? Or? Yeah, so when we speak to high schools, that's one of the one of the main things we promote um, for the students to be able to make a change is to do meatless Mondays in their schools. And um, we usually connect them with Christine Middleton, who works for the Humane Society. She's their meatless Mondays spokesperson, she's based in Oakland, so we partner with her to help schools in Oakland. But not in the elementary school, you're not familiar with it yet. Not yet, but our goal is to have it ready by next semester. Yes? Um, do you usually seek out schools, or do the schools come to you? Both. So the easiest way for us to get talks is through direct referrals. If someone's a teacher or a parent or part of a group, um, that's, and they're like, hey, I saw this great thing, let's bring it in. That's, that's the best way for us to get involved. But we do get some you know, random email requests to speak. And we also do mass outreach just to high schools and colleges in the area. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, what are the consequences of the uh, farm companies and why What was the question? Uh, well, I was asking about uh, corporations from other countries buying our products or buying our companies. Um, so there's a Chinese company that bought Fields, <coughs> which is the world's largest pork producer. Um, and a lot of a lot of the dairy that's raised in California now is now being sent to China. Dairy demand is decreasing in the U.S., so increasingly it's being shipped to China. Also, a lot of the alfalfa that we grow here, which is the most water-intensive crop, is shipped to China to support their dairy industry. So it's kind of ironic. We've been doing that to other countries for a long time, using their resources for our people. Now China is starting to do it for uh, to us. They're using our water to support their dairy industry. So, I mean, it's a problem. But these are all multinational corporations that are exploiting people and resources all around the world. So it's it's just one big industry. It's all part of the same problem. Yeah. Yeah, and actually USAID has worked to spread American factory farms in other countries. So it was USAID that brought Smithfield into Mexico as part of the development plan and into Romania as well. So these companies are, I mean, yeah, it's really a global problem. This is kind of a related question. How do we, how do we get to cut down the Amazon rainforest? You know, what, like, what, what, what gives us the, uh, or whatever, I mean, not privileged, but like, why, why are we able to cut down the reports? Well, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's not as directly related to the United States as that's being that are. Um, Brazilian need a lot of its supplies to Europe, so sometimes they're multinational workers. Yeah, and I mean, often it's local people too, like, they're struggling to survive because of globalization. The only way they can make money is to cut down forests and grow corn and soy. So it's, yeah, I get it, it's all part of the Problem. Yeah, free trade agreements. I mean, that's the, the simplest answer is that free trade agreements are what give us the right to do that. And um, there's, they're negotiating new free trade agreements. So there's the um, there's one with Europe now, and there's the, the Trans Pacific Partnership with Asia and TAFTA with Europe, which would expand free trade rights. And they would actually give corporations the right to sue governments who say that they can't deplete their land. So, like Costa Rica just. Um, they said that a Canadian company couldn't cut down the rainforest, they had to build a strip mine, and that company sued them for violating free trade agreements. 
So they're, they don't get talked about at all in the mainstream media, but it's really horrifying, and it's one of the main ways that these corporations are able to do those things. So that's a great action that you can take is to call your representatives and tell them not to pass any more. Monsanto GMO and that caused the death of the butterflies when um, they put it in the corn and stuff like that. Yeah, we're just focused on animal agriculture, so we always talk about the connection between GMOs, you know, the animals are fed more interest in genetically modified products, but we don't have any presentations focused specifically on that. There are a lot of other great organizations like Pesticide Action Network that are more focused on that. Um, there's a, the Beekeeper Alliance also has presentations on how um, neonicotinoid pesticides are killing the bees. So, yeah, there's, there's groups that are going to work on that. Any other questions? Keep it going. Yeah, thank you. It's Ben? Yeah, that's Great. Well, thank you so much. And